Oh. 
many of the rest of you knew, you all know this song? Everybody knew it except me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't grow up with that song. That's great. You know what I know it? You knew it? Oh, yeah. But I said, you did all right. You didn't know you didn't know it. I can sing along anyway. It's a singable song for sure. Okay, how many children here? How many wish they were children? Yes. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's kids' time. So uh, the children are the kids. Ready? Kids and the children, same thing, right? More or less? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, I've got something to show you and something to talk about this morning. I want to talk about um, everyday miracles. So miracles are like huge big deals, special events, um, extraordinary, um, huge, I'm running out of words here, miraculous, that means often we think of miracles in connection with God or Jesus in the Bible, the doing of miracles, the healing of people and so on. But there are miracles that I call, and not just me, I hope, but they're like everyday miracles. Everyday miracles. And we just have to kind of open our eyes. And so I've got something to, to uh, I want something for you to listen to, first of all. Okay, so I'm in my backyard. It's Thursday, just this last Thursday, right? In the afternoon, and I heard this. Same tree 
This is the third year. Two years ago, uh, they came on September the 28th. I don't remember what day of the week that was. Last year, they came on September the 28th. And this year, they came on September the 29th. So they have come. That's when I noticed them anyway. So they have come uh, at the same time each year. And I'm, I'm positive that these are the same birds. We've lived in this house for 30 years. <clears throat> lived in our house for 30 years, and we never had yellow-bellied sapsuckers in the trees behind our house until two years ago. And then last year, they came again. And this year, they have come again. And what goes through my mind is, <clears throat> What are the chances that a different pair of birds would come to the tree in different years? What, why? I'm, I'm absolutely positive these are the same birds, and they have come back to the same tree. Now, two years ago, they stayed about nine days, nine, ten days. Uh, last year, they stayed longer than two weeks, and then they leave and they go someplace warm. And then, a year later, they're in the same tree. Now, it's not just the woodpeckers. We have a pair of wrens, house wrens, Jenny wrens, we call them when I was a kid. And they come to a bird box in our backyard, uh, and it's about five years in succession. And they will come at a certain point in the spring, they will check it out, check out the bird box. They leave for a while. I don't know where they go, but they come back and they nest. And so I'm not sure it's the same, you know, parents and so on, but these birds are coming back to the same yard from someplace you know more. And I think that's like an everyday miracle. It just astounds me, you know. And right now, in your backyards, <clears throat> in my backyard, it's pretty busy because there are quite a few birds passing through. And for you who are bird watchers, the white-throated sparrows, four or five of them are there. Hummingbirds have already left, they've gone. A couple of days yesterday, there's one brackle. Now, most of the grackles, they may not be your favorite birds, right? But there's just one, and it's got left behind somehow. It's on its own, but it's not going to stay either and uh, various other birds are, are passing through on their way to someplace else. And they'll fly to Central America, South America even, and next spring, they'll come again through. Uh, some of them will come through our backyard. And to me, that is an everyday miracle. It's a miraculous kind of thing that these birds can return to the same tree from one year to the next. I mean, what kind of navigational system is that? When I was a kid, when we thought somebody was not really very bright, well, no, I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't have said this myself, but some other kid said, so-and-so is a real bird brain. And it, it meant they had a small brain and they weren't very bright. But as you get older and you watch things, you think, these, these small creatures have a magnificent brain that can take them from this part of the world to that part of the world and have them come right back to it. So that's my point today. Now, uh, all the kids, the children, you who are young, younger people, young people, um, that's for you, but mostly, mostly, I find, you know, it's the adults. The adults remember this stuff. The, the adults, this makes a big impression on them. So, so really things are a bit backwards because the sermon later on, you know, Adults will listen to them. They really listen to the kids' time because that's really accessible. And so uh, in, the, in the week that's coming, and you see what's happening around human nature, you may see you know, some of our Canada geese migrate, some go, but there's a lot of activity uh, in our yards and our fields and so on right now, and they're what I would call uh, everyday miracles. So I'll leave that.
And Marta is going to read the text for today, which is from the Gospel of Mark. You have to turn it off. <laughs> You know, one time, one time, I was preaching at Westminster. I was doing something at Abu I was preaching. And uh, we had this uh, alarm clock that made a, 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 a certain sound. And my wife timed it to go off at a certain time. I think it was for kids' time. And it went off sometime later. So this is, it really changes things when an alarm clock goes off during sermon, so better now than a bit later. Thank you, my God. The scripture today is from the book of Mark, uh, chapter 8, verses 31 to chapter 9, verses 1, and it's on page 977 in the Pew Bibles. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke quietly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God and come with power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, folks, we have a bit of a problem this morning. I cannot wander around. <laughs> but you could, actually, because that mic's not working either. We're just hearing you. Okay. Well, I guess I can wander around. <laughs> so thank you for that. Now I'm not sure what I should do. Well, let's find the text first. Let's do the text. I have a Thursday morning Bible study group, and we've been reading through the Gospel of Mark. And so we've been reading through this passage that that I just uh, has just been read for us. Now. <coughs> that passage about if anyone wants to come after me, they should take up their cross and follow me. Okay, now, I went to church from the time I was a baby. The Disciples Church in Mayford. I was carried to church, you know, like when I was this big. And uh, there were a number of teenage girls. It's a bit older than me, anyway. And uh, later on, these, these young women, well, they were now women, they, they would say to me, you know what? When you were a baby, we held you in church because there was a pew, and there were a number of these teenage girls, and I sort of got passed along. So I know, you know, uh, these witnesses. I was there when I was, you know, this thing. And that may have been the case for you, too. And so I grew up in the church. And I became a Christian through the church. And you may well have been carried, like that song? <laughs> Maybe in the womb you heard that song. You should know that, I guess. But anyway, uh, we may have grown up in the church. And there's no time when we didn't know God. And uh, we made our confessions. Uh, we may have been confirmed in the, in the church. And, and then much later, my eyes fall on this text, which provides the 
title for the sermon. If anyone wants to come after me, let them take up their cross. And I read that and I think, what have we got ourselves into? You know, a cross, you say. I'm not sure I signed up for that. Right? What have I signed up for here? A cross. Now the crown and the streets of gold, fine, but what about the cross? So I want to explore this question with you for a few minutes. I want to set the stage by, by explaining the text that was read for us a little bit. So, Jesus and his apostles are on the way to Jerusalem. And three times he announces to them that he's going there to suffer and die. A nasty death. He's going to be put to death. He's going to be killed, as this text says. This is the second one that we read, and there's another one. It's the third time in which he makes that announcement. And following that announcement, he... he uh, says, if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to follow me, it's not like an invitation. Would you please follow me, or I'm inviting you to follow me. He makes this announcement, and then he says to his apostles and others with them, if anyone wants to follow me. He's just talked about going to Jerusalem, and those of us who read the Gospels, we know how the story is going, and we know there's a cross. He doesn't mention a cross, does he? He says he's going to be killed, and then he says, if any of you want to follow me, take up your cross. Which would mean, I think, it, it says here, it's going to mean denying oneself. And it's going to mean gaining life. And then the text ends with uh, a recognition that in some way, or a promise in some way, that some of those who are there with him, as he says this, are going to experience the king, coming of the kingdom before, you know, while they're still alive. I think this is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. I think because the kingdom comes in some sense at that time. So some of those who are with him on this road are going to experience this manifestation of, of the presence of God in the kingdom not so far away. So, I forgot to tell you the one, didn't I? Okay, explanation of the text. Considering the cost. Universal human phenomena of being a follower. So he says to them, if you want to follow me, you know, as human beings, largely we're followers, aren't we? We are followers of ideals, we are followers of leaders, we are followers of inspirational people, followers of people who have shown themselves by their teaching to have long outlasted their life on earth. You know, we're followers of Buddha long ago, or followers in more recent days of, of uh, people that we admire a lot, Desmond Tutu, um, religious leaders. Martin Luther didn't set out to, to start a church. He was a reformer, but his followers, there were those who chose to follow him, and so there are Lutherans. And in our own day, those who don't believe in the way we, we do as Christians, they often follow too. It might be some secular teacher, secular scholar, it might be a, some diet guru or, or whatever. There are so many followers. And even people who say, I'm not a follower, have joined the group of the non-followers, right? So, for most of us, we're going to follow somebody or something. We're followers. So he says here that if you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost. 
Now Jesus has just said he's going to be killed. And he makes these remarks in the shadow of what he said about himself. Because you and I who read the text, we know that he's going to bear a cross. And then he says to them and to us, you're going to bear a cross too. Take up your cross and follow me. When I say cross, what does that bring to your mind? Well, when I think of the cross, I think of suffering. I think of pain. I think of uh, maybe loneliness, the loneliness of dying an ignominious death. Uh, that's what I think of when I think of a cross. I think of suffering. And Jesus in the garden, you know, says, Father, maybe there's another way. But there isn't at that time. And apparently there isn't for us either because he says, if you want to be my follower, you need to take that your cross. He says, he says, Deny yourself. Deny themselves. Now in the text that we're going to read, it's a, it's a gender-specific translation. But then it says, are all alone or present. Really, there's no gender in that word there. Whoever wants to follow. You know, whether you're male or female, a boy or girl, whether you're old or you're young, no matter who you are, anybody who wants to follow me must deny themselves and take up their cross. So there is self-denial here. There is the giving up of self. There is becoming selfless, so to speak. There is humbling oneself. And this is a choice that we're going to make. We're going to choose the way of self-denial and selflessness. Now that does not mean that we should think of ourselves as, as becoming doormats for the world. A great book from the Middle Ages is called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Aquinas. Some of you have read it. It's a, a great devotional classic. But in that, in that book, very often Thomas Aquinas speaks in language of, of uh, like we, we human beings are like worms, you know. We are just no good at all. And that's not what Jesus means here. He means that those of us, we, if we're going to follow him, we can give up what is rightfully ours for the sake of the gospel to become his followers. Now, is the cross for all of us? Uh, we can go on with that. I need to keep up with the sermon, right? <laughs> When Jesus carries the cross, he carries it for others, doesn't he? Because he takes with him to the cross the sins of the world. So he dies for his friends and he dies for his enemies. And this choice to live selflessly, to live selflessly means to give up what is rightfully mine or might come to me for the sake of the gospel. And to live in the shadow of Jesus who, who uttered these words that he's going to the cross. So is the cross the same for everyone? Is the cross the same for everyone? I would say the cross is the same for everyone in that there is a cross for everyone. It is the cross that Jesus gives us, but it's not the same depending on our circumstances because we are all different. And our walks in this world are different one from the other. And my experiences are not your experiences. My trials and my, my um, potential and so on, we are all different. So the cross must be different depending on who we are in our situation in life. But the cross itself, namely that of selflessness and uh, living for others, um, that remains the same, doesn't it? It's the same calling for all of us. And that, that, that calling uh, may come 
earlier on in life, later on in life. And if you, like me, were carried to church as a baby, then, then later on you had to make this choice for yourself, didn't you? It's a choice you have to make for ourselves. We may have known the gospel from the time we were, you know, so little, but at some point along the line, we read this and we make it our own. We say, oh yes, I am going to follow. And I must tell you, when I read this, it's not so long ago, I thought, you know, that comes kind of a surprise. Um, are you serious? Cross. I mean, who chooses the way of the cross? Who chooses that? Now, I might, I might rather choose somebody who has, offers us, you know, plenty and uh, freedom from suffering, freedom from trials, uh, all the friends in the world, and on and on and on and on. And Jesus, what does he offer his followers? He offers them the cross, which would not seem to be very appealing. Really? Amen. Sometimes the cost can be very great. I remember, uh, and this incident stands out in my mind, uh, I was a graduate student in Soviet Armenia. In the time of the Soviet Union, in Armenia, like other Soviet states, uh, faith was frowned upon. Now there's an Orthodox church, and people might nominally be part of that, but not actively. But then there were some more serious, I shouldn't put it that way, there were some Baptists, and there were some one or two other groups of evangelicals who pretty much had to make their faith public. And at that time, in that place, uh, if you were part of the Orthodox Church, you were going to the Baptist church, because the Soviets, it was a mental sort of thing, if you want a refrigerator, you go to the store, there's one refrigerator to choose from. Why do you need more? Why do you need 50 kinds of toothpaste? Toothpaste is toothpaste, right? A fridge is a fridge. So you go to the store to buy one, there might have been one that was a bit larger than the other, but it's just a fridge. And they applied that to religion as well. If you're not going to be part of the Orthodox Church, the National Church, then you're going to this church. So the Baptist Church in Yerevan had about, I don't know, two or three hundred people on a Sunday morning. And they had Bible studies. And they were quite serious about their confession. And I went to an apartment with uh, friends from that church one time, and there was a kind of a Bible study group meeting in an apartment, in this apartment. And there was a man there who was who worked for the city, who was an engineer of some kind. And he was becoming a Christian. And that was going to cost him. It might mean he would not get a promotion that he otherwise would have got. He could have been sidelined in various ways, but it would cost him. There were perks for being members of the party. If you were a Christian, you, was kind of, you couldn't really be a member of the party. And he was crying. He was a man in his 40s or 50s even, and he was crying because he was becoming a Christian and he knew that this was going to cost him. He was going to have a cross, wasn't he? He was going to have a cross. As Jesus goes on, he says, he talks about our life. And life is just more than life, I think, that he's talking about here. Whoever wants to save their life, hang on to their life, that is, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Who gives their life in service to the gospel will save their life. That is what really is life. And what good is it if you gain the whole world Yet forfeit your soul, that is your life, your eternal life. Or what can you give in exchange for your soul, for your life? You can't give anything. Your life is the most precious thing, isn't it? 
And in these terrible storms that we have witnessed recently, you heard these words. There are people whose houses are washed into the sea, and they said, you know, we're all alive. Because their, their lives were more important than any material possessions that they might have. So we understand that. And Jesus says, rightly says, um, you got the whole world, is that going to bring you happiness? Is that going to bring you contentment? Is that going to bring you a bit of peace? It's not going to bring you any of those things necessarily, is it? And then he goes on to say, and this is really a message for the early church, is it? Anyone who is ashamed of me, my words of the gospel, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, that's Jesus himself, will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So there is an anticipation of the future here, isn't there? Now he doesn't mention the words kingdom of God, does he, in this text? But I think that those who choose life are part of that kingdom of God, which takes a different way in the world, which goes a different way, takes a different path, namely of selflessness, self-denial, and following Jesus. We do a lot of searching around, don't we? And in our lives, we take this path, we take that path for a while, maybe take some other path. And here is the path. Here is the worthwhile path. Getting the life is an expression that was around. I don't know if people still use that, but it was said, you know, by parents who wish their kids would move on, Go get a life, maybe. I don't know, maybe these weren't going to send you. Go get a life, your own. Go get a life. But here, how do we get a life? Jesus says, you want to follow me. You want to know life. If you want to know worthwhile life, then take up your cross and follow me. Now my conclusion, I think it comes next. You've got to think about being a disciple, don't you? Am I going to take up that cross? Now, for all of us who have gathered here, we have, we have taken up that cross. I'm, I'm thinking pretty much everybody here has done that, has taken up that cross. And for those of you who are young, this decision may be one that weighs on you in days ahead. How am I going to live my life? How am I going to do this and how am I going to do that? But this is a worthwhile life because it's lived, it's lived for a greater purpose. Uh, namely, God's presence in the world, the kingdom of God. It's a worthwhile life. Some of us work in service professions, service jobs. And a word that comes to my mind quite often is the word useful. Uh, what we do is useful. You know, to be useful in this world. To do something that's useful, which can be to alleviate human suffering. It can be to teach people. It can be to heal people. It can be to volunteer at the library. It may be to be a big brother or a big sister. To be useful in this world is an expression of caring the cross of service. And then, a lifestyle. This is a word we use, isn't it? A lifestyle. We want a good lifestyle. It's really the way we live. Um, this is a, the, the gospel calls us to a lifestyle, doesn't it? A style of living, a way of living. And at the same time, it gives us a pathway through. Jesus speaks of uh, an adulterous and sinful generation in his own day. And I suppose that's as true now as it ever has been. Because there's a way, and there's another way. And so the path that Jesus calls us to is the way to life. Because he gives his life in Jerusalem, and God the Father gives it back to him. And if we will lose our lives like Jesus lost his life, then we will, we will receive 
right at now and in the hereafter. So those are my thoughts. A cross, you say. Let me think about it. So, as we enter a new week, there's something for you to think about. That's the takeaway, to spend some time thinking about the life of service to which we have been called. Okay. We respond <coughs> to God.
Help us earthlings to move with wisdom into a different world than the one we knew just a short time ago. Raise up people who are wise and smart and good to take us through perilous times. And Lord, in these days of truth and reconciliation in our country, when we recognize horrible things that were done to indigenous peoples in the past and into the present, and sometimes in your name, enable all of us who inhabit these lands to make amends, to find forgiveness, to heal, and to share a path into the future. Lord, as warmer weather gives way to the explosion of movement and color and change that comes with cooler weather, attend all those creatures, from the birds to the whales, that, that make their way across continents, guided by behaviors that you have implanted in them. Bless them all. And as for us, Enable us to take time to breathe in this special season. As we turn toward warmer places, help us find peace within ourselves and to trust that all will be well. Lord of the heavenly armies, our world is again witness and actor in a war so brutal and so careless of human life that only the most elderly among us have seen its likes. We pray this day for those who serve our country and who are training others for the attempt to defend Ukraine or who are stationed in places like Latvia. Our world seems to be under threat. Make us be on the side of right as you see it. Bring down the warmongers Give vindication to those who defend and protect the powerless. Lord of this community of believers, we pray that you will heal the sick, give rest to the caregivers, comfort the grieving, give safety to our children, and lend courage to the elderly. In the week that we have entered, <coughs> May the experience of your grace make us resilient in trying and difficult situations and times. Enable us to be your people fully, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Debbie reminds me with the song from her youth that there was another song that that I grew up with that went this way. Must Jesus bear, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Did any of you go over that? We all had songs uh, about uh, yes. um, So, in keeping with the lesson, that we chose this song, Take Up Your Cross, uh, number 211 in uh, the uh, blue book. I'm going to sing that.